Welcome to the SIBO Doctor Podcast with Dr. Narala Jacoby, a US-trained naturopathic physician and medical director of the SIBO Doctor, an online education resource for practitioners. This podcast is intended for SIBO treating practitioners and aims to help educate how we may best serve our SIBO patients. Medical experts join us to discuss functional digestive disorders, clinical practice, and research as it relates to SIBO and associated conditions. Head over to thecebodoctor.com where you can learn everything about SIBO from the basics to advanced treatments. You can also join in the conversation on the SIBO Doctor Practitioner Forum Facebook group. If you're a patient, please note this information is not intended to diagnose or treat medical conditions. Please ask your doctor before initiating any new treatments. We welcome you to head over to the SIBO Lifestyle Facebook group, where we post frequent tips and videos to help you on the road to gut health recovery. And now, over to Dr. Jacoby and the SIBO Doctor podcast. Welcome SIBO practitioners to another episode of the SIBO Doctor podcast. And with me today, I have the distinguished Dr. Satish Rao, who many of you may know from his research into SIFO that uh, really helped a lot of us put the pieces together as to why so many of our patients, um, maybe not improving uh, with normal SIBO uh, treatment protocols because they also have SIFO. But what I'm going to be talking about uh, today with him is going to be, uh, it is a really sort of a study that created quite a buzz in um, in our community, and that was the research into brain fogginess and prebiotics. Uh, sorry, probiotics and SIBO. I'll have him elaborate um, on the study in just a moment. But I wanted to give you an introduction. He's a very distinguished uh, physician and professor. He's currently the director of neurogastroenterology and motility. Um, and the Director of Digestive Health and Clinical Research Center um, at the Medical College of Georgia, and will have his full bio in the show notes. He is a uh, federally funded researcher and investigator, and we're really honored to have him on the show. So very warm welcome to you, Dr. Rao. Thank you, Nirala. It's a pleasure to be on your show, and it was lovely to meet you earlier this year as well. Yes, we actually uh, presented at the New Orleans uh, uh, Integrated SIBO conference where you actually talked about the SIFO study, I believe, and yes. um, went more well, into I that. I touched on the brain fogginess too at that time. but That's, that's right. And I, I nabbed you and I said, look, we, this is something that we've talked about as practitioners for some time. There's some controversy around that whole issue with which bacteria produce D-lactate or L-lactate. So why don't you introduce us to the study and what you found? So uh, that's, a, that's a good, that's a good uh, segue to really talk about uh, the study. So the way it all started was as a gastroenterologist with an interest in neurogastroenterology motility, I tend to see a lot of patients with gas and bloating, distension, and I've seen them for years. But what happened about five, six years ago was uh, over a short span of maybe uh, almost like two months, I came across two patients who, in addition to these classic symptoms of gas, bloating, and distension, were complaining of brain fogginess. In fact, the first patient was even more interesting because she was referred not by herself or her physician or a gastroenterologist, but actually by her employer who felt that this um, uh, very highly performing individual was no longer performing at the level that she had performed for very many years in the same company. So he, he was very alarmed, and he tried to seek out a physician who can help answer her problem. She had already seen about five gastroenterologists before uh, he referred her to me and, and so on. And then this other lady actually came from New York. So I live in Atlanta, which is in the South. So both of them presented with this brain fogginess as a very important component of their symptom. So we were very intrigued. Um, we knew we could answer perhaps her gas and bloating because we've seen and diagnosed almost daily 
lots of patients with SIBO, lots of patients with C4, an overlap group. But this brain fogginess completely caught us by surprise. So naturally, uh, as, as gastroenterologists, we rarely see, because brain fogginess is, I suspect, a symptom that people with uh, normally go to neurologists or psychiatrists or psychologists, I think, or internists maybe, but not to a gastroenterologist. But we do see some patients with uh, altered mental status, if you like, and these are folks with chronic liver disease, patients who have cirrhosis of liver. We see hepatic encephalopathy, where you know the liver is uh, failing, and therefore a lot of ammonia is accumulating in the body because liver is the main site for clearing ammonia, which is a toxin produced in the gut. So if the liver doesn't work, ammonia accumulates and these patients become foggy and they become mentally cloudy and so on. But these two individuals had normal liver function, normal kidney function. They had no other organ that was malfunctioning except this symptom. So we felt strongly that this has to be some metabolic component. I researched, I talked to friends and folks, and then we set about to see, well, what may be the metabolic component that these folks are producing that could be triggering this brain fogginess. Now, this was not like they were continuously in a brain foggy state. This was transient, but it would last sometimes up to two to four hours. Often after a meal, they would say it comes on an hour or so after meals. So we were trying to make this connection between eating, gas and bloating, and brain fogginess. So, That was the background that led ultimately for us to do this research uh, very meticulously to try and tease it out. So what we did was we did a standard glucose breath test in these individuals to find out whether they had SIBO. And alongside the glucose breath test, we measured a number of um, uh, enzymes and hormones and so on in the body. For example, we measured fasting glucose. We measured fasting insulin. We measured fasting L-lactic acid. We measured fasting D-lactic acid. We measured ammonia and, and, and glucagon and few other uh, uh, levels. And then after the meal, we re-measured them at periodic intervals. So they were doing the breath test, They were also doing some blood tests, and they were doing some urine tests. And cutting a long story short, what we found was they they became brain foggy. Uh, Along with that, when we got the lab results back, they were producing very high levels of D-lactic acid. And that made the connection that somehow, and we didn't know why, somehow these people were producing a lot of D-lactic acid, and I knew from having seen some patients in the past that D-lactic acid um, is normally a very small amount is produced in the body. It's mostly in the gut, very small amount, and we clear it from the kidneys. But if you produce a large amount, then our body does not have a very efficient clearance mechanism. This is different to the L-lactic acid. Now, all of us produce large amounts of L-lactic acid periodically. For example, if you jog, if you exercise, if you run, the cramps that you get in your muscles is L-lactic acid. That is what causes the cramps. And then, you know, you will stop running or stop exercising and very soon you feel fine. The L-lactic acid is clear. But D-lactic acid is a different story. It's not coming from the muscle, it's coming from the gut. So we identified that sure enough that these folks were producing D-lactic acid And then the reason why D-lactic acid was happening was because they had SIBO. And then we also went on and cultured the gut juice in in these folks. And in some of them, not in all of them, we recovered lactobacillus, which was strange. But we've seen that before even in SIBO groups, but we we were finding this here. And we recovered other bugs that we know, strep and so on, that causes SIBO, Klebsiella and E. coli. Then we you know, went on, collected a large series of patients. Then we started looking at a group that did not have brain fogginess, but also had similar gut complaints, gas, bloating, distension. And we compared the two. And we tried to really look carefully as to what is it about this group with brain fogginess that is different to the group without brain fogginess in terms of their 
symptoms, in terms of their demographic features, in terms of whatever else they were doing. And we found that the one thing that was really common, all 30 patients in the brain foggy group were taking probiotics, whereas only two of the eight in the non-brain foggy group, but with gas bloating distension, were taking probiotics. So that was one important distinguishing feature between the two groups. So we said there is something between probiotics and this brain fogginess. And then, of course, further research clearly showed that lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, et cetera, which is common ingredients of probiotics, if they colonize the small bowel and if they are in turn exposed to sugar, then they will ferment the sugar in the small bowel and not only produce gas and bloating, which we all recognize as SIBO, but in addition, they'll produce D-lactic acid. And this D-lactic acid, because they're producing large amounts very quickly, because fermentation, as you know, happens very fast, uh, the brain has, is exposed to this large amount and it goes foggy. Until the kidneys clear this D-lactic acid, they remain foggy. And once the kidneys clear it, the brain fogginess goes away. So that was the f- finding and that was the association that then is what we described in this paper. So that brings up so many questions right away. Um, and the first one I'll, I was wondering is if you assessed what type of probiotics were, they were taking, because, you know, when, when you get into the specifics of strain specificity, there are certain lactobacillus, uh, lactobacillus strains that we know can produce D lactic acid. And there are others that are more lactate fermenter, like into L lactate fermentation. So, was there any assessment of what type of probiotics were being used by these 30 patients? So that was a challenge for us. No, we do have it. We, we, we documented that very carefully, but there were several challenges we faced. One, many people, um, uh, sometimes they were taking two or three different probiotics. Number two, sometimes they were not even aware they were taking probiotics. They were taking something they thought was a herbal supplement that had some biotin in it, that had some multivitamins in it, but they had no clue that it also contained large amounts of probiotics. Uh, And only, I guess, of this group of 30, there were maybe four or five patients, I'm just not remembering now, were um, given this uh, prescription probiotic in US called VSL number three. And the remaining folks were taking all kinds, some from Walmart, Walgreens, Cultural. Um, there were a whole variety of them. With regards to the ingredients, when we checked as best as we could see, almost all of them had lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, for sure. Some of them had streptococcus. Some of them had mainly bifidobacterium, I think. So there was a whole combination. There was not one type of probiotic or a combination that stood up, but it was just uh, a whole whole batch of them. So it wasn't any one particular one. And yes, you, you're right. I mean, the, the, the probiotic industry is not regulated uh, in the US anyway. And, and, and uh, there are some companies that take a lot of diligence and produce very good probiotic compounds. And there are the most of them have absolutely no regulation. We have no idea, no quality control and we don't know what, what is in those probiotics. So people will take this whatever they get. So Yeah, and that maybe is a, a good um, a sort of starting point for a new study because we're all really fascinated with, uh, with this topic because, you know, our um, education through the SIBO doctor really focuses on strain specificity and using research strains and using... Um, very specific or uh, probiotics for specific conditions and not just randomly giving patients uh, multi-strain and untested probiotics. So from, you know, so we, so I think we do know a little bit more about probiotics now than we did before. So, you know, things uh, or strains like Lactobacillus LGG, for example, which you mentioned the culturel, as far as I know, is not a D-lactate producer and, and not a lot of bifido. So definitely lactobacillus acidophilus and um, uh, lactobacillus lactis and bulgaricus 
tend to be more delactate producers, which then begs the question, what is the environment in which these um, organisms then uh, produce these or produce the delactic acid? The other question I had was, uh, what, did you also find correlating levels of ammonia, which of course is also, because I think you mentioned that you were um, measuring ammonia as well. No, there was no, um, ele- there was only one or maybe two patients, there was a slight elevation in ammonia, but they, all the remaining 28 of them had no significant elevation in ammonia, no changes in glucose, no changes in insulin levels, um, urea, nitrogen, liver function, they were all pretty good. So there was no other abnormality in these patients. And then um, your study then concluded because you've administered antibiotics to your uh, to your patient or to these to this group, and brain fog improved. So my question is, how do we know it was the pro like that? It was the probiotics and not just SIBO that you were treating with the antibiotics. So it's a good question, and I think you know we we were. Uh, this was the first time we've made this connection observation. We are now uh, getting ready to start a prospective study where we will try and tease this out a little bit more carefully uh, and, and, and assess this a little bit more. But the, the challenge for us was these folks were already very sick. And they had lost jobs and some of them had quit working. They were very sick. They have traveled hundreds and hundreds of miles, thousands of miles to come and see me. So it was very hard for us to really... Uh, uh, you know, come up with with uh, a, a further study involvement. So we, once we made the association, the connection, as I said, we cultured the duodenum in in uh, many of these patients, and and when we found evidence for infection, either through the glucose breath test or through cultures or both, then we used that information along with their allergy profiles um, and the bugs that we grew to try and direct the antibiotic therapy. And, 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 and we gave them a combination of aerobic and anaerobic and gram-positive, uh, sorry, a broad-spectrum antibiotic. But we treated them for, I typically treat my SIBO for four weeks, but these guys, we treated them for up to eight weeks. This, uh, the sec, sorry, uh, we normally treat them for two weeks, and we treated these folks for four weeks. With refactoring, I assume. Some of them had rifaximin. I don't think all of them had rifaximin. We would give them all kinds, you know, depending on what they had and what bacteria we grew. Uh, we, we gave them a variety, whether it was, uh, you know, um, Bactrim or, or even penicillin derivatives. And also many of them got uh, tinidazole or metronidazole for anaerobic coverage and so on and so forth. So we gave them a whole, whole spectrum of them. Along with that, we had them discontinue their probiotics. So there were two things we did simultaneously. We had them all stop their probiotics and we had them uh, take antibiotics. So we did both. And so sometimes some people have asked me, well, do you know which was the predominant? And it's hard for us to say that. Uh, the, in seven of these 30 patients, we did not find evidence of SIBO, either through the breath test or uh, through or through our uh, glucose breath test. But two, I believe, had very high D-lactic acid levels. So although we didn't find evidence of SIBO, we still went ahead and treated them because we thought that the SIBO was distal and our techniques are not good, so we were not picking it up, and that's the reason. But five of the 30, we did not give them any antibiotics. They had mild elevation of D-lactic acid, and, and we decided that we will only have them discontinue the probiotic. Overall, I think, you know, we found about nearly 75% response rate, 80% response rate in improvement of the lactic acidosis when we surveyed them again three months after completion of treatment. Not everybody, but I think the majority, 80% got better. And, and mind you, these were very sick folks and they've already seen half a dozen gastroenterologists before they came to see. So that well, was it. Well, what's so great is like we've always just, you know, sort of associated D-lactic acidosis with short bowel syndrome. And and to see this actually evidenced in um, patients with SIBO and without SIBO, and perhaps these patients had more large intestinal issues or or dysbiosis uh, of what we would call dysbiosis in in where the microbiome is supposed to be. But the fact that D-lactic acid was measured is really sort of a a very uh, intriguing 
piece of the puzzle, I think, for many people. And I think a lot of practitioners can relate, actually, to the symptom of brain fog because it's a really common uh, symptom that patients report to us. But I think what you're saying is it's not just the uh, brain fog that we often see with especially CFO or fungal overgrowth. I th I'd say that's probably, in my experience, one of the most common symptoms that patients report. So what you're saying is like, I've had a few patients that I think fit more the criteria of what you mentioned, where it's incapacitating, that the brain fog became completely incapacitating. Would you say that's sort of the criteria you used? Absolutely. I mean, those first two patients who came to see me, they were really incapacitated. And there were several more in the course of our, of our study over four or five years. That's exactly what we found. It was very incapacitating for them to the extent. That's why I said, I'm sure, I mean, of course, since the beginning of the study, now we've become more tuned to it. And likewise, after this publication, I'm sure many gastroenterologists and other practitioners have become so tuned to it that they will ask for the symptom. But either many times, I'm sure the patients never mentioned it to the physicians, or if the patients mentioned it, the physicians dismissed it. They said, mm. brain fogginess? Oh, you must be just joking. This is mm. maybe just too tired or whatever. You know, mm. they attributed it to some vague, and then they moved on and never gave them attention. And, you know, once uh, physicians tend to be a little dismissive, uh, the patient also becomes a little bit more shy and introverted, and they don't mention this anymore. Because they think maybe they're thinking that we are crazy. Yeah, mentioning it. We don't usually important. have that problem, Dr. Rao. <laughs> as, just, as integrative practitioners, we we get all kinds. We get you know we we see so many different people that that have digestive symptoms that that are systemic that have systemic symptoms from their gut problems. So we're no strangers to that at all. So no, you want? I'm just saying our patients yeah. become. Like that. So I, I know. Think, yeah, I know. That your patients are forthcoming with that story. So. Oh, I put it on my questionnaire. Brain we fogginess is a primary. Is something that we definitely are very are seeing a lot, and it's so wonderful to have researchers like yourself to actually bring it into the mainstream and and look at the the connections between. Um, the microbiome and dysfunctional microbiomes and SIBO and CIFO and uh, look at systemic symptoms from these altered states, really. So a um, couple more questions in regards to delactate uh, in general. So um, I think what your study really did beautifully is demonstrate the fact that we need more research in this area. And what you're saying is you're hot on the tail of that. You're going to uh, look deeper into uh, this phenomenon and hopefully also, you know, really look at strain specificity because you do a lot of aspirates. And so this is the perfect environment in which to really pinpoint what's actually happening, which strains are um, associated more with delactic acid um, ac um, acidosis. Question about, um, and just so the, for the listeners, I gathered a lot of these questions from other practitioners because I needed all the help I can get with uh, finding out more about delactic acidosis. So question was also, um, so just generally, you've, you've mentioned that L-lactic acid is more sort of, um, um, sort of a muscle thing. My understanding is that it also is uh, quicker converted into pyruvate and more used as an energy source. And so people don't tend to have fatigue and brain fog due to this um, conversion. Does it? Does D-lactic acid cross the, uh, the blood-brain barrier and that's what it, why it causes brain fogginess? Yes, it does cross the blood-brain barrier. And it, uh, that is one of the reasons why it, cross, why it causes more brain fog. Thank you for listening to the SIBO Doctor podcast. We hope you found the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients. Thanks to our sponsors, SIBOtest.com, a breath testing service with easy online ordering, and Quintron, maker of outstanding breath testing equipment. Tune in again for another episode of the SIBO Doctor podcast. Thanks again for listening.